now listening to a Purple Crayon Productions broadcast. Hi, I'm Sophie Falvey. I'm a 20-year-old history minor and I have access to JSTOR through my college. Using this incredible power, I'm going to do my best to guide you through the history of monsters and other scary things from the modern horror canon, from their possible origins all the way through their pop culture cameos in recent years. It's a little bit of folklore, a little bit of true crime, and a lot of those weird moments in history that lie in that liminal zone just between the logical and the completely unaccountable. This is Mystic History, Vampire Edition. Seventeen twenty five. The Austro Hungarian Empire covers most of Central Europe and is pushing into the area that is modern Serbia. Now it's amidst this Austro Hungarian occupation that Peter Blagojevich appears at the door of his home and asks his wife for his shoes. His wife, terrified, tells her neighbors about his visit. They agree that there's no need for Peter to ask for his shoes, he's been dead for ten weeks. For the residents of the town of Kisilova, it's a foregone conclusion. Peter Blagojevich has returned as a type of revenant they know as a vampire or vampire. They're also aware of the danger posed by the visit of a vampire, who returned from the dead to waste away other members of their family and community, and oftentimes their family and neighbors will quickly drop dead. And shortly after Blagojevich's wife meets him that night, a neighbor reports being strangled by him in the night, and then in quick succession, eight people drop dead. And Blagojevich's friends and neighbors know what to do. They go to his burial site and dig up the corpse, at this point a couple weeks dead. Blagojevich is found with a long beard and without too many signs of decomposition, which disturbs the villagers. Even worse, quote, in his mouth did I see fresh blood, which, after the general opinion, he had sucked from those killed by him, writes the breathless Austrian soldier stationed in the area. To keep the vampire in his grave, the villagers drive a stake through the heart of the corpse of Peter Blagojevich and rebury him. Now, this incident is regarded as the first historically recorded case of vampirism as we know it today. In fact, the word vampire travels to Western Europe from Serbia as a result of this, which is why it's the same across so many languages. It's vampire in English, vampire in French, vampiro in Spanish and Italian, and even vampire in German. The case of Peter Blagojevic was only one of many in this region and at this time, and in fact, it doesn't even seem like the most famous one. Europe in the early 18th century actually goes through a kind of mass hysteria about the Serbian vampire, referred to as a vampire panic. It starts in Central Europe, the Balkans, where this type of revenant comes from. First, there's Peter Blagojevic, and then there's Arnold Paul. And if Arnold Paul doesn't sound like a particularly Serbian name, that's because it's not. Because the only historical record of this story that we have actually comes from Austrian officials. The only name we have for this man has been translated into German. So we know him as Arnold Paul, but he knew himself as something slightly different. Paul returned to his town, also in Austrian-occupied Serbia, after serving in the army and quickly married a young woman who lived next door. One day he admitted to her that during his time in the army he had been pursued by a vampire, who he eventually killed. Though I don't know what the right word in this situation for killing something already dead would be. He said that after he killed it, he ate some of the dirt from the vampire's tomb and bathed his wounds in its blood. He thought that maybe the vampire had somehow done something to him. Paul didn't have long to be afraid. A couple weeks later, he took a fall from a cart and then died pretty quickly after. But as I think you'll probably guess in a story about vampires, the story doesn't end at his death. 
because soon after he died, four of Paul's neighbors reported that he had visited them. And then those four neighbors died, and his other neighbors began to panic. So 40 days after it had been buried, Paul's corpse was dug back up. And again, the townspeople were disturbed by what they found. His skin appeared fresh, his nails had grown, and when they pierced his corpse, blood appeared to flow out. Faced with the frightening prospect that Paul's corpse would return again, they staked it, decapitated it, and burned it. The four others who had died were also staked, decapitated, and burned. One detail that seemed to particularly frighten people was that when they staked Paul's body, he seemed to groan as if in pain. Unknown to these, I think, rightfully frightened townspeople, and certainly unknown to Arnold Paul himself, they were setting off a panic that would cross a continent and inspire an image that would last centuries and wind up becoming the vampires we know today. In 1731, so four years later, in the same area, 17 people allegedly died of similar symptoms over the course of three months. It didn't seem like anything necessarily supernatural until a young girl reported being attacked by a man referred to as Milo, who had recently died. At this point, the townspeople began once again to suspect a case of vampirism. Now, we know all of this because the Austrian emperor himself had heard of these vampire attacks by this time and ordered a man titled Regimental Field Surgeon Johannes Fluchinger to go to Serbia and gather accounts. Fluchinger tells us that the townspeople dug up Milo and found him to be similarly alive-seeming to Paul. Anxious, they disinterred 40 recently deceased bodies, 17 of which they found to be showing similar symptoms of vampirism. Then they staked and burned all the bodies. Now, Fluchinger's report traveled back to the emperor, and by the next year it was being circulated in newspapers in England and France. The story was sensational and swept Western European countries it was published in, even inspiring a panicked debate in the Catholic Church who were shocked that corpses should be disturbed and mutilated after burial. Over the course of the 18th century, clerics blamed the devil for inspiring fantasies of revenant corpses, or blamed the devil for reanimating corpses. But they couldn't stop the popularity of these stories, by this point, the Serbian vampires had Europe in a thrall, terrified and excited, and it was these same reports that would inspire an English writer to bring vampires into the literary world. So, how do we get from the Serbian folkloric vampires, whose defining features are their ruddy complexion, their robust bodies, their beards, and, and touches of blood at the mouth, to the mysterious, rather slim, noble, and even sexy stock vampires that we break out around Halloween today? I guess that's my main question here. Like, how did vampires get sexy? Their Serbian ancestors are, are these bloated, decomposing corpses who appear to individuals to suffocate or, or drain their victims of blood. Sure, they can be vanquished by a stake through their heart, but they're also decapitated and burned like the werewolves I discussed last time. So the answer is obviously complicated and honestly full of some of the weirdest stuff I've ever read. Um, vampires have kind of lived two lives since the 18th century. Now, these lives are interconnected, sure, but really sort of fundamentally different. On one hand, you've got the folkloric vampires, the ones in Serbia or other places I'll talk about in a moment. These vampires are understood as real revenants that terrorize members of the community by killing them from beyond the grave. And it's from these folkloric vampires that we get literary vampires. And I'm making this distinction because in my research, I found that we are obsessed with vampires, genuinely obsessed with them. But specifically, we're obsessed with what they can mean in the context of a narrative. And this changes and shapes how we see vampires. Vampires in literature have had a genuine impact on real events as well, but they're much different than their folkloric cousins. So today I'm going to talk about the folkloric vampires, and I'm going to try to break down a little bit of what might make them so compelling to the people who have been so frightened by them. Vampires getting far too much love to the detriment of other groups half undead. Those elitist bastards skulking in their castles, sleeping in their velvet cushioned coffins, shunning daylight in the mansions like they had something.
So archaeologists in Venice working in these Renaissance plague pits have uncovered a skull with a piece of brick that was placed between her teeth about six weeks after she was buried. Now, forensic anthropologist Matteo Barone suggests that the explanation lies in the 1679 tract by German writer Philip Rohr called De Masticatone Mortuorum, which I'm completely butchering, but that's fine. Um, but that translates to the chewing dead. And in it, we learn of the Naxere, which again, I'm completely butchering, but that means after devourer in German. This entity, a revenant like the vampire, but also about as capable of higher functioning as a horror movie zombie, would nibble at its own fingers and burial shroud. But as it did so, it would simultaneously be killing the surviving members of its own family. And after killing its own family, the Naxera would begin to eat the neighboring corpses buried nearby. So perhaps this piece of brick is the legacy of the Naxera, an attempt to stop this resurrected corpse from continuing to threaten her own family. The Venetian skull and the Naxera aren't the only vampire-like revenants that predate the 18th century craze. The Slavic vampire had existed in various iterations for centuries, and there is evidence for the belief in Greek Vrikolakas, another vampire revenant, as far back as the Neolithic period, when heavy rocks would be placed atop particularly dangerous corpses to keep them from rising. One interesting similarity here is that the Slavic vampire and the Greek Vrikolakas are both reported as suffocating their victims. The Vrikolakas sits atop its victims at night, and the victims of the vampire thought to be Peter Blagojevich reported being throttled by his apparition shortly before they died of 24-hour illnesses. Of course, these are only two examples, and from regions that are relatively close together. The truth is that these quasi-vampire stories appear in many and varied cultures, and in many different ways. I'm going to try to break down these folkloric vampires and quasi-vampires into a couple pretty universal themes, like I tried to do with the werewolves. According to Matteo Baroni, the forensic anthropologist I mentioned earlier, quote, I think it's connected to two deep aspects of human thought, death and blood. Death is our inevitable destiny, blood is our life fluid. The vampire connects these two aspects in a paradoxical way. It is a corpse who escapes death by drinking blood, end quote. And while I like this quote, I think he's talking about what attracts us to vampires now, not then. I want to broaden it a little for the sake of these folkloric vampires. So I think it's certainly true that these are creatures that live liminally between life and death. They're the revenant, they've returned from the dead, and, and oftentimes, as we've seen, their physical corpse is going to bear marks that signify this, even if it hasn't physically moved from its burial. Most of what I've read implies that, again, like horror movie zombies, they're not really themselves but an apparition of what's frightening about death. The corpse that was once human, but that in death has become entirely inhuman. This leads me to my second criteria, that they're predatory. These semi-living, semi-dead revenants exist oftentimes to kill their loved ones, usually by preying on them. It's a really fantastic example of memento mori, the Latin injunction to remember death is coming for you, and reminds me of a gravestone epitaph that gets used a lot, but first appeared in the tomb of Edward the Black Prince in Canterbury. Translated, it reads, quote, Whoso thou be that passeth by, where this core and tombs lie, understand what I shall say, as at this time speak I may. Such as thou art, sometime was I. Such as I am, such shalt thou be. Death is predatory, and it will come for you one of these days. Of course, it comes for some sooner than others. I want to turn to a couple ways that historians and scientists have come to understand this phenomenon, which winds up being something that hits kind of close to home. The key is that in these cases of vampirism, the family of the vampire dies, and then the neighbors and the community members outwards in a ring of contact. So in a way, these individuals really are sucking the life force from their friends and family from beyond the grave. Only the tool is probably disease. Scholars have blamed outbreaks of disease on these vampire panics, and it makes sense in Venice, which was undergoing an outbreak of the bubonic plague. In fact, scholars have linked outbreaks of disease directly to vampire panics. 
In 1998, a Spanish neurologist named Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso connected severe outbreaks of rabies in the Balkan region in the 1720s to the vampire panics that we know took place in the years shortly after. Interestingly, the connection to rabies may not end there. It's possible that garlic wins its reputation against vampires because people afflicted with rabies are often hypersensitive to intense stimuli like bitter smells or even sunlight. Rabies, of course, is not the only medical explanation. Some doctors suggest a condition called erythropoietic protoporifera, which renders a person's skin oftentimes much paler and always hypersensitive to sunlight. Of course, the issue with relying on this or the rabies explanation for vampirism is that they do little to address one of the few things that seems universal in vampire mythology, that these creatures act from beyond death. Well, I think it's true that symptoms of these diseases may have had a hand in cultivating ideas surrounding vampires, like the garlic aversion. I'm not very compelled by them as wholesale explanations. I think, and obviously I know nothing ultimately, but I think that the idea that vampires are a lens through which to understand the spread of general disease is much more compelling. And couple that with perhaps incomplete understanding of human decomposition, and it makes sense that people would worry that the dead had returned. Death is scary, and, and the line between life and death is often much less firm than we want it to be. And look, every day I sit down and turn on my computer and watch videos and do research, and I don't have a clue how it operates. And then sometimes, at the end of the day, I drink a White Claw, and honestly, I'm not sure how they make it taste like seltzer. What, what I'm saying is, almost without thinking, we take a lot of things on trust. I honestly have no way of knowing that my car isn't a transformer, because I don't have all the information about cars, but I trust that it isn't because that's just the way that I understand the world. And that's understandable. I stumbled across a lot of really bizarre smugness in my research about this specific set of beliefs. One person even bemoaned the idea that while the rest of Europe entered an age of enlightenment, these Serbian farmers were plagued by superstition and ignorance. I find that idea elitist, self-important, and frankly tainted by years of ethnic prejudice in writing about these cases that would paint Slavic people as quaint, ignorant farmers in contrast to the enlightened people of Western Europe. The fact is that the communities of Peter Blagojevich and Arnold Pohl were people faced with terrifying, mysterious tragedy. I mean, their families and neighbors were dying, and it would not be fair to them to discount the horror of their situation. I'll also add that by all accounts I could find, when the news of these tragedies reached Western Europe, those who read the accounts were just as terrified. Again, death is scary. I want to close with one last story, a little closer to home. In the 19th century, New England, like many parts of the world, was stricken with tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, or TB, or consumption, is a wasting disease whose victims become progressively frailer and almost as if they're having the life sucked out of them before they die. It's also contagious and oftentimes would wipe whole families out. You can see where I'm going with this. It's an era and a phenomenon that has come to be known as the New England Vampire Panic. Though folklorist Michael Bell has found vampire exhumations spread as far west as Minnesota. Vampire ritual varied widely across states in this time period, much like types of vampire folklore did in Europe. Bell theorizes that vampire theories crossed over with the various waves of Germanic and Slavic immigrants to the area, and really stuck around because many of these people were living in extremely isolated conditions with very few resources. For most of the 19th century, no one had any understanding of how tuberculosis worked. And when they did, people in these communities wouldn't find out for a long time. So we see instances of vampire exhumations taking place all over this region. A community is struck with what is likely tuberculosis, but understood to be a vampire, and the family, or sometimes the entire community, will participate in similar vampire defense rituals to that which we see in Europe. Oftentimes, like the staking, these rituals will focus on the heart, which would be removed and burned. Sometimes, too, the cadaver would be rearranged in a pattern of a skull and crossbones. It's important to note, though, that though news reports of these rituals refer to the suspected revenants as vampires, we have no record in these communities of anyone calling them vampires. We only understand that the circumstances and precautions around them significantly mirror those of vampire folklore. Now, tuberculosis was devastating. Some estimates hold that at the dawn of the 19th century, one in seven people that had ever lived had been killed by TB. And it had an especially heavy impact on these already tiny, impoverished New England communities. The most famous of these cases, the, the face of the New England vampire panic, if you will, was a woman named Mercy Lena Brown, whose family knew her as Lena. 
The Browns lived on a homestead in Exeter, Rhode Island, which was then a community of only 961 people, and was also called Deserted Exeter. Tuberculosis tore through the family. In 1882, Mary Eliza, Lena's mother, died of the disease. In 1883, Lena's older sister, Mary Olive, died of tuberculosis at 20 years old. The Smithsonian article I'm getting most of my information from actually makes a point of referencing the fact that the assembled town sang one sweetly solemn thought, a hymn that Mary Olive had selected herself before she died. Again, these are people. Death is scary and serious. I think that's important to make clear. Soon after the deaths of their mother and sister, Lena's brother Edwin fell ill as well, and left for Colorado in hopes of recovery. Then, in January of 1892, ten years after her mother had died, Lena Brown died of tuberculosis at the age of 19. Her case had been what is referred to as galloping, meaning that the illness was not as drawn out as her sister or mother's, and certainly not Edwin's, who was alive at this point. Lena's death, it seems, was a little quieter than her sister's. Shortly after his sister passed, Edwin returned to Rhode Island, himself taking a definite turn for the worse. And this is what pushed the Brown family's neighbors in Exeter to suggest an alternate treatment to rest in warm climate. Now, by all accounts, George Brown was deeply hesitant to concede that his wife or one of his daughters might be feeding on Edwin from beyond the grave. Eventually, though, he allowed a small party of community members, including a journalist and the family doctor, to disinter the bodies of his family members. After all, this was his shot at saving his one remaining child. They were looking for the corpse with blood still in its heart. Much like the signs of vitality we've seen before, the blood would indicate the vitality that the revenant was stealing from Edwin. And of course, they found it. Remember that this is winter in New England, and while her mother and sister's bodies had been decomposing for 10 years, Lena Brown's body had been lying in a crypt in freezing conditions for just a couple of weeks. So the doctor found a little clotted blood in her heart, and that was enough for the party. They removed her heart and liver, burnt them, and allegedly fed them to Edwin. Two months later, Edwin would die. I'll say it again, death is scary. And the idea that it's predatory isn't hard to understand, especially in the context of disease. But vampires have lived a sort of double life. While I hope I've been able to provide some clarity for the reason they exist in folklore, it's likely the literary vampire that you recognize from movies and books. Next episode, I'll discuss the literary life of vampires, how they evolved from these almost zombified revenants to the dapper, even sexy vampires we know today. In the meantime, sleep well, I guess.